Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks, and this is our third video on the topic of clock recovery from a binary data stream. In this video, we're going to cover our heuristic analysis and discussion of our clock recovery PLL, which is really an extension of our discussion in the second video on this topic, where we were looking at uh, the, how the sampling gate phase detector works in conjunction with the VCO uh, to sample the VCO output uh, near uh, the peaks and valleys or top dead center of the respective unit interval or bit time. So if left uncorrected, we'll slowly slide off of top dead center, uh, but we are constantly generating these correction voltages. The correction voltages in turn are smooth and they adjust or nudge uh, the VCO rate one way or the other such that we are sampling the uh, received data near the um, Zero the uh, falling side of the um, uh, of the VCO output. Now that's the, to form our phase detector output. Okay, again, we're not trying to sample the data and near the zero crossing, but we are trying to sample the VCO uh, near that zero crossing in order to generate a clock which is well aligned with the received data. So we we talked about how. Um, positive feedback actually uh, on the positive going side can actually help drive the system toward the stable negative feedback region where we want to operate in steady state. Okay, so in this video, we want to continue our discussion on this uh, PLL, how it works. Again, more heuristic in nature, uh, although we'll, we'll get into a little bit more quantifiable uh, analysis and simulation uh, uh, toward the latter half of this uh, video. So let's jump into the uh, clock recovery PLL subsystem again. Uh, we see the same structure I had in that previous video. Um, we're taking the incoming data, which is at a slightly different rate from the VCO. Remember the VCO is sitting around 2.5 gigabits per second. It's sitting here at 2.5 gigabits per second. This data rate over here is 2.501 gigabits per second coming in. It's been low pass filtered by the channel. Remember, we've got this data coming in that's blue, looking like this. It's a low-pass filtered version of the ones and zeros that have been transmitted. That comes in to our PLL. We threshold it here, so to form more of a square wave version of that low-pass and attenuated signal, and that's going to sample our VCO output. Um, what we want with the VCO, ultimately, is we want something like a very low bandwidth or DC-like signal driving the VCO. That's going to give us a nice, quiet VCO output. And, of course, we want that DC value uh, to be set such that the VCO output rate matches the received or transmitted, uh, the transmitted data rate or the output of the, uh, the channel. Um, now, there's a couple. Now, so then the question comes in, well, what exact purpose does uh, the integrator and the lead lag filter serve in this loop? So we, as I said, we want it so because we want a DC signal here, uh, but we don't have a DC signal here. What we want is to essentially have the average value of this phase detector output here reflected on the VCO input here. So that means you need something like a low pass filtering function to do that. And of course, an integrator is very, very, very much a poor man's low-pass filter. It certainly greatly emphasizes the DC. It has infinite gain of DC, and then it has some, you know, very gradual 20 dB per decade roll off to attenuate the higher frequencies. Now, of course, it's not a great low-pass filter, and that's where the pole in the uh, lead lag filter comes in, or the lag portion. We, we, what we don't want is something called reference feed-through. That is the reference data or, and or what we're calling our uh, poor man's clock to feed through into the output. That leads to unwanted, you know, spurs um, in particular. And so uh, to deal with that, we've got in here this extra higher frequency pole in the lead lag filter. If we look underneath the hood of this block, we've got um, this pole, which sits actually at bit rate divided by a thousand uh, in radians per second at least. So that's sitting here at bit rate divided by a thousand. And so, um, at that, uh, that's in radians per second divided by two pi, you'll get where that pole is in, in, uh, in hertz. Okay, so, so that helps, uh, you know, the lag, the, the pole here helps with the reference feed through. The integrator here helps with emphasizing, uh, giving you high DC gain and some additional low pass filtering. 
And then we've got the zero in the lead lag filter. So what purpose does that serve? Well, we actually need that to correct for the effect of the integrator in conjunction with the integrating action of the VCO. The integrator has a gain of, of uh, in this case, it's going to be, you can consider this a gain uh, over S, okay? A coefficient of S is 1. Uh, so this is an, a 1 over S or 90 degrees of phase lag operator. The VCO also has a K over S type of phase domain transfer function. So it also has integrating or 90 degrees phase lag action. And so that combines for 180 degrees of phase lag, which can lead to instabilities in a feedback loop. So the lead uh, portion of the filter uh, stabilizes the loop by adding phase lead over critical bandwidths or the bandwidth of interest for the phase lock loop. So if you look underneath here, we're adding phase lead and there's a at, uh, bit rate divided by 34. If we take uh, bit rate, divided by 34, we can find that uh, particular rate there, about 8 kilohertz, so um, out to, let's say, around 100 kilohertz or so, out from, you know, a few kilohertz, we're adding phase uh, over that, that range. And, of course, that helps stabilize um, the greater loop here that we're uh, interested in. All right, so and then what we're essentially doing is we take uh, that BCO output. As I said, we are thresholding that we form a square wave or a recovered clock. That recovered clock in turn is sampling back over here later outside of the substance sampling this data. So everything gets turned and twist and turned inside out. We start with data. It becomes clock. This clock here becomes data and later it becomes clock again to sampling the input data. Okay, so it's kind of full of twists and turns. All right, and where it samples that uh, incoming data, the recovery clock is right here. And then we threshold it and we view it on a scope over here. All right, so if we wanna add a little bit more rigor or quant uh, quantification around this PLL, we can always use, uh, one example would be a phase domain model of the PLL. And that's what we've done in this separate uh, breakout model. We've essentially taken, if I um, bring up both at the same time on the screen, um, we've got essentially the integrator and the lead lag filter blocks just copied down here. We have now, we didn't just copy the VCO block, we've got a phase domain version of it, which is basically a gain over S. And for the, and um, for the, phase detector, we notice we don't really have any dynamics. We just got a subtraction operation. We don't have any type of gain, attenuation, or filtering going on for it. Now, typically a phase detector would have a one over two pi approximate gain associated with it. Um, but in this case, we've essentially just called it one. We, we just, you could you'd say we've put a one at this point in the system. Um, and that's because typically in PLLs, you have a canceling effect of the 2 pi in the VCO gain uh, in the numerator with the 1 over 2 pi or 2 pi in the denominator of the phase detector. So we've chosen just to omit it since those 2 pi factors tend to just cancel each other out anyway. So now we can run uh, this type of PLL here in the phase domain. And here I have set K1, K2, K3 to match the K1, K2, uh, the effective gains in the other model. I didn't call them K1, K2, K3, uh, but they're essentially the same value. So if we go underneath model properties in the callbacks, you can see K1 is 1E minus 8 times bit rate. K2 is 34 divided by bit rate and the same numbers that I showed you and I computed down here in MATLAB before. So everything's the same. I can run this model and see what it gives me in the phase domain. Uh, let's just call that up. We'll, we'll run it, hit play. We'll see what happens. And if I bring my scope over, we can see that this is the step response. Now, I also have something in here where I can overlay current and previous, and that's so that I can compare previous step response runs to the current one. So as an example, if I were to um, change K1, down here, say K1 is 25, say K1 is equal to uh, half of that, 12.5, I could run it again, and we can see them overlay with each other. Now you can see the new run uh, brings down the overshoot, 
uh, versus the K1 of 25. So now what I want to do, I'll, I'll change it back to the original K, K, K1 is equal to 25. Now what I want to do is uh, use this, uh, use simulate design optimization, a different capability here, different product, to optimize the selection of K1, K2, K3. So I attach that block to the a node of interest where I want to optimize the step response. And then I set some parameters describing the constraints I want to put on that step response. So as an example, I say I want the rise time to meet a two um, microsecond constraint. I want the settling time to settle within uh, four microseconds. And what is settled, it needs to settle within 1% of the final value of one within that four microsecond period. It should, have, should not have more than 10% overshoot or 5% undershoot. Okay, so that creates my step response constraints, which you'll see if I click on response optimization, you'll see those step response constraints. It should rise within two microseconds, settle within four microseconds, within 1% of steady state. Now I need to tell the tool which parameters uh, it's free to optimize upon. And I'm going to select K1, K2, and K3 as those three parameters. Say OK. And now it's going to take those design variables and I'm going to hit the optimize button and it's going to try to tweak those, run the model. So there's an empirical aspect to this and then there's an analytical aspect to change those K1, K3, adjust them in the direction to give you a better step response. So I hit optimize. It brings up this optimization report. You can kind of see uh, the intermediate progress it's making uh, in our Simulink window. And it looks like it's doing a pretty good job. It's settled down here with this yellow waveform. I will close this. And it, this, is the, this was the final result it achieved. We can also look at that result over here. I can run the model over here. And it shows that response. The previous one was that blue waveform and the better one is the um, is the is the yellow okay so we settle faster we have less overshoot less undershoot okay it's a better response so we can now take these values and bring them back into our main clock recovery model and see if they work better uh, over there as well that would be the ultimate um, payoff okay so I won't do that now just for the sake of time that's a pretty easy exercise to do I would just need to go into my model callback section and change, um, or actually I hard-coded them here, so I would use a variable I could put in those K1, K2, K3s here and try the model again and see if it works, indeed settles faster, has less undershoot and overshoot. Okay, uh, that's all I wanna say for now. I, I may do more videos on this greater topic of clock and data recovery in subsequent videos where perhaps we explore uh, different architecture, different different phase detectors, etc. Okay, thank you for tuning in. I'll signing off now.